I am waiting, by Christopher Isherwood. The incidents which I am about to describe are true, but I can offer you no proof, at least not for the next five years. By that time, you will probably have forgotten that you ever read this story, so please believe it or disbelieve it, just as you wish. Today, October 17, 1939, is my birthday. At the age of 67, I am what you or anybody else would call a failure. I have no career, no outstanding achievements behind me. I have never married, and I cannot truthfully say that I have ever been loved, though half a dozen people are perhaps mildly fond of me. I live in a pleasant house in the outskirts of a town not far from Hartford, Connecticut. The house belongs to my younger brother, a successful and energetic lawyer. Mabel, my brother's wife, is very kind to me on the whole, as long as I am careful to be tidy and not unnecessarily visible. There are three sons, all grown up and married. They frequently visit us with their wives. All these people are well disposed toward me, I think. Why shouldn't they be? I am no sponger. I pay for my board and lodging with a small inherited income. I do try to, not to be a nuisance, though I know I am sometimes rather a bore. With reference to the story which follows, I need only add that I have never at any time had reason to believe that I possessed psychic powers. I have never been particularly interested in spiritualism, astrology, or the occult, and I know no more of the works of Professor Einstein than does the ordinary semi-educated man in the street. On the evening of Friday, January 6th of this year, I can be exact, for this was the day after the anniversary of my brother's marriage, I was sitting in the drawing room of our house alone. The others had all driven into town to go to a movie, so I could enjoy the luxury of drawing my armchair into the very middle of the he of the hearth rug, facing the monopolizing fire, facing and monopolizing the fire. The time was about twenty minutes to nine. I remember this because I kept glancing at the clock on the mantelpiece, in order to be ready to turn on the radio and listen to the news broadcast. This clock is a wedding present given to my brother by the members of his firm. It is made of china and vaguely supposed to be valuable. A boy and a girl in peasant costume are supporting the clock itself, contained in a basket of purple and green fruits. It would probably have joined several of the other wedding, wedding presents in the trunk, trunk room years ago, but my sister-in-law likes it, and so it remains. I may have dozed off, as I so often do. At any rate, I had closed my eyes. When I reopened them, it was with a violent start, as though somebody had called my name. Perhaps the others had returned unexpectedly early. Some such thought passed through my mind, but I didn't turn my head. I don't know why. All my drowsy attention was focused upon the clock, and what I immediately noticed was that the left hand was missing from the china figure of the peasant boy. It is very difficult for me to describe my precise sensations at that moment. In order to do so, I have to think back to a time when this discovery had no particular significance. I saw only that the hand had been broken off, wondered how long it had been broken, and was surprised that I had never noticed it before. Mabel would be cross, I thought, and this led me to a fear that I might somehow have done the damage myself while I was asleep. I rubbed my eyes and sat up suddenly in my chair. I blinked several times. How absurd! I must have been dreaming. For now, as I examined the clock, fully awake, I saw that I had made a mistake. The clock wasn't damaged after all. The china hand was still intact. One morning, about a week later, when I was walking in the garden, Mabel came out of the house with an expression of extreme annoyance on her face. Wilfred, she said, I'm afraid I shall have to fire Annie after all. Annie was our new maid, and she wasn't being a success. Why? I asked. What's she done now? Can you imagine? Mabel exclaimed. She's managed to break the drawing room clock. She was dusting it, she says. She must have used a sledgehammer. But already I was pushing past her toward the French window, which opened into the drawing room. But already I was pushing past her toward the French windows, which opened into the drawing room. Entering the room, I saw what in my excitement I had dimly expected to see the china boy's left hand was broken off at the wrist. Half an hour after Mabel had shown me the damaged clock, I had forgotten all about my dream. That evening I sat alone in front of the fire and regarded the mutilated boy without a flicker of recollection. Next day the hand was mended, almost without a trace. There was nothing left to remind anybody of the accident. And yet, 
when the time came to remember, I remembered everything down to the smallest details. The second occurrence took place at 11.25 a.m. on Monday, February 20th. I was in my bedroom, standing near a bookcase which occupies the corner behind my bed. Mabel, as far as I know, was in the kitchen with the cook. The maid was cleaning the bathroom. My brother was at his office. None of my nephews were staying in the house. It was a gray morning, although from where I stood I could not see out of the window. I knew by the pattering noise on the glass that it had begun to rain. I had just decided to look up some passages in the ring in the book. I am very fond of reading Browning. As I, rec as I reached my hand for the volume, I experienced an extraordinary sensation which swept over me, leaving my body tingling and trembling, and the sweat breaking out on my forehead. I stood there as if frozen, with my hand outstretched. What followed cannot have taken more than a minute, perhaps it occupied only a few seconds. At first I was aware only of a change of mood, very difficult to describe. I felt lighter, happier, as though some oppression had been lifted from my mind. Lighter, yes, that was the exact word, for my room was actually full of light, bright sunshine. The sun was casting shadows on a wall above the bookcase. I could feel its warmth on my hands and the back of my neck. As I stood, I began not only to feel and see, but to hear also. Sounds were coming up through the window. From the garden below, I heard laughter, voices, the noise of a tennis ball being hit back and forth across the net. Then one voice, much more distant than the others, called out, Come on, Joyce! Give them hell! They're beginning to crack! It was my youngest nephew. Joyce is the name of his sister-in-law, my eldest nephew's wife. No words of mine can, can describe the strangeness of those familiar words and sounds. I listened to them as a dead man might listen to the voices of the living. They were so near to me, yet so immeasurably remote. Oh, tricky, very tricky, I heard Joyce exclaim. And Bob, my eldest nephew, retorted, What do you think you're playing, ping pong? That was all. The next moment, the contact, or whatever you like to call it, was broken. My fingers had touched the book, and there I was, back in the gray, clear continuity of normal consciousness, with the rain pattering fast on the pane behind me, and the light of a February morning all around. I heard the maid come out of the bathroom and begin to descend the stairs. I forgot exactly what I did next. I think I must have paced the room several times, backward and forward, pausing to look down through the windows at the wet tennis court and the empty garden beyond. I was deeply excited and disturbed, Although it still wasn't entirely clear what had happened to me, I was aware that something had happened, something so dimly tremendous that it dwarfed every other experience of my whole life. I carefully wrote down what I had heard and seen, as I have described it here. When I had finished, I felt very tired. I lay down on my bed and slept soundly till lunch. Thereafter, I was like a reader who searches for some half-remembered passage in a book. I had a kind of of assignation with a certain moment in time. Could I find that moment, or would it find me? Obviously, if I had really traveled into the future and not back into the past, I should have several months to wait. It was very difficult to be patient. Toward the end of May, Jack, my youngest nephew, came to visit us. He was to stay a fortnight. The fine weather had started, and the tennis court was already put in order. Whenever anybody spoke of tennis, I, who have never taken any interest in the game, felt my pulses throb with suppressed excitement. But where were the other actors in the strange, meaningless little drama I hoped to witness? I repeatedly asked Mabel if my, and my brother if Bob and Joyce were expected. No, they said not yet. Bob, who was a certified public accountant, had an auditing job in Boston. He wouldn't be likely to visit us before August. On the afternoon of Saturday, June 3rd, I returned by bus from shopping in town. It was about a quarter to three. Hearing a confused sound of voices from the garden, I decided to slip into the house by the back door, not wishing to meet the visitors, whoever they were. I was hot, dusty, and laden with parcels. Encountering nobody, I climbed the stairs to my room. I had brought several books at the local stationery store, and my first thought was to unwrap them. As I moved toward the bookcase, I heard Jack's voice on the lawn calling the score. Fifteen all, a girl's voice, which I didn't recognize, cried, You skunk, you're cheating! Oh, good shot, lousy! 
Don't try that Forest Hill stuff here. Damn! Come on, Joyce, give them hell. They're beginning to crack. It was there, my moment. And even as, with a gasp, I recognized it, it was past. It flashed by me and was gone. Long before I recovered my wits sufficiently to hurry to the window, the actors had spoken their familiar lines. The drama was over. Looking down into the garden, I saw Jack, Bob, Joyce, and a strange girl chatting and joking across the net at the end of their game. The girl was a friend of Joyce's. She had been brought over in, in the car from Providence, I later discovered, when Bob planned this surprise visit. He had come to stay for the weekend. Almost exactly two weeks later, on the afternoon of Sunday, June 8th, I had gone into the trunk room to hunt for some old photographs. The trunk room is at the top of the house. It had no windows, only a skylight let into the roof. It is crowded with bits of damaged furniture, cardboard boxes, and old trunks. Mabel, who was sitting in the drawing room, had made me a promise to put everything back exactly as I found it. She also suggested that I should wear one of her aprons. Wondering where to begin my search, I decided upon a scarred and much-labeled Gladstone bag which looked large enough and ancient enough to contain the entire family archives. Blowing off some of the dust, I knelt down beside it and undid the fastenings and straps. No sooner had I done so than the contents began to spill out over the floor. It was packed full, almost to bursting, with papers, bills, copies of old magazines, theater programs, newspaper clippings, dance cards, autographed menus, and all kinds of fascinating relics many of them dating back to the end of the last century. I was delighted and began examining these treasures, quite forgetting what it was that I had set out to look for. In this way, I must have passed about a quarter of an hour. Then, as I still bent over the papers, the attack seized me. This time the sensations were different and incomparably more violent. My ears began to sing, my limbs stiffened, and a convulsion like an electric shock seemed to take place at the base of my spine. Half fainting, breathless, dizzy, I barely ha I had barely time to think. It's going to happen again! Then I closed my eyes. How long the fit lasted, I don't know. Probably it was very brief. Gradually, my arms and legs relaxed, my head cleared. I began to inhale deeply and easily. The sense of relief was exquisite. Very cautiously, I opened my eyes and looked about me. At first, I hardly recognized the room in which I found myself. It was the same room, but the papers, the trunks, and the furniture had all disappeared. The floor on which I knelt seemed to have been recently scrubbed, for it was quite clean, and the cobwebs had been dusted away from the corners. Looking up at the skylight, I saw a patch of clear sky above my head. Its brightness suggested an early summer morning. For several minutes, I didn't move. I was scared, of course, but much more excited than scared. Rising to my feet, I performed what was unquestionably the bravest action of my life. I walked over and turned the handle of the door. It was locked. For some moments, I stood stupidly, twisting the knob in my hand. Then I began to rattle it, to beat the panel with my fist. Finally, I shouted aloud, Let me out! Let me out! There was no answer. And after a while, I stopped. It was no good. The house must be empty. Slowly, I returned to the middle of the room. My heart was beating so fast now that it almost choked me. My brain was racing like an engine. I've got to get out, I kept telling myself. I looked at the skylight, but it was too high above me, and I had nothing upon which to climb. From boyhood, I have admired, though somewhat grudgingly, the extreme lucidity of my brother's intelligence. Now as I stood there, baffled, I asked myself, what he, would he, who was never at a loss, have done in my place? He would have applied himself, as he always did, to the available data, no matter how scanty. Well, that must be my method also. Wouldn't this bare room yield up some small clue? I started to examine it foot by foot with the eyes of an amateur detective. And we will pause there.